Just quickly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, collaborators on a number of uh, the topics that will be our own work that I'll be talking about. Um, to start it off with, sorry, move faster. Uh, to start out with, I'd like to just define a few terms to put us on a common ground. I'm going to be using, a ter uh, using the term diatomics. That means just two atoms and pulling a molecule apart or pushing it together. So everything I'm going to be talking about has to do with energy or force versus separation. Chemisorption, which is having an absorbed atom on a surface and doing the same kind of thing, pulling it off and pushing it on. Adhesion, now separating a solid at a plane. Into, uh, uh, into two surfaces and an interface. And in light of last week's uh, comments, this will involve concepts like surface energy or, and, and breaking force for its separation, or uh, as the fraction mechanics people call it, maybe both one. Uh, cohesion, which is to uniformly blow the solid apart and so expand and contract it. And something I'm going to call slip, which is sliding one plane, uh, red sliding one half space over another half space. And uh, we'll call that O2 to have an analogy with the uh, fracture people. And uh, when you do these kinds of things, you get curves that look like this. This is the energy versus separation. If this were a bulk process, that well depth would be the uh, cohesive or the cohesive energy. If it were separating two surfaces, it would be the surface energy. And in this region, you have an attractive force. And if you try to make it go in this region, you get a very strong repulsion. And the derivative of that curve is, going to, is the force or the stress. If you're sliding one half space over another, you see a similar thing. You push, you run into some sort of barrier, energy barrier. And again, if you take a derivative, you have some maximum force involved in that process. I'm going to be dealing mainly with metals and some very idealized models. So, uh, recently now you see uh, uh, calculations being done in very complex systems. And in the past, uh, that wasn't true. And so the issue I want to address now is what's changed, uh, what, what's changed in this situation to cause, uh, to cause the ability to do these, uh, these calculations. Uh, if we're dealing with a perfect solid in the way a solid state theory worked before, the main element is periodicity. And even though you have something like 10 to the 23rd particles per centimeter squared, you can reduce the problem. Uh, let's see, how did I do this? Uh, you can reduce the problem to actually solving it in uh, something called a unit cell because that, that structure is repeated throughout the solid. And in fact, you don't even really have to do the whole cell. There are other symmetries you can take advantage of. So you might have something like a Wigner site cell or Rewind zones. And that was something to save face because it wrote on the back of the wrong side of the slide. <laughs> and uh, so uh, even though you have this huge array of uh, particles, you really only have to solve the problem in one of these regions. Now, the first principles calculations, as far as certain properties of solids have gone, have been incredibly successful. For example, as far as electronic structure goes and transport properties, uh, they've done a very good job of predicting the experiment. And the main problem has involved uh, the energetics, uh, uh, calculating energetics. And in fact, it's only recently uh, that uh, you could tell that these calculations would tell you which had the lowest energy structure for metals, BCC, FCC, or HCP. Uh, but now techniques have improved sufficiently to deal with that problem. Uh, okay, uh, I guess that's the problem. Uh, now, let's just consider a very idealized situation. This is a, uh, an F, uh, FCC 100 surface. The squares are at the top, the surface atoms. These other figures, whatever they are, the rotated squares are the next layer down. So, uh, we, and let's consider the interface between this top plane and the next plane down. And we'll see what the difficulty is now in treating uh, real problems. 
or at least idealized real problems probably from the standpoint of most of the people here. Uh, suppose you just take that, that interface now and twist it four degrees. You see that the situation changes from this very nice picture to an extremely complicated picture. And this shows what the problem is in trying to do first principles calculations on this, on this particular system because now you have really no simple periodicity to take it to uh, take advantage of in a calculation and this is an extremely simple situation. Now if we look at this we have to realize that even though you've done this twist boundary that this isn't the minimum energy configuration actually. This is just holding the two pieces rigid so if you really wanted to know what was going on in this configuration you'd have to do some sort of search for what the global minimum would be. <laughs> now if you add the complications of uh, translating, say, in, uh, in sliding, as Uzi and Mark do, you can uh, appreciate the magnitude of what they do. So, uh, this, uh, when I go to, I'd like to have you keep this picture in your mind so that when I discuss the various potentials, you see what problems are involved in applying the techniques. <coughs> There's an additional problem I wanted to mention with this, is that uh, when, uh, also, when you're doing these calculations and first principles uh, calculations, there's a difficulty in that you're subtracting two very large numbers, and this is part of the reason why the uh, this is part of the reason why this difficulty would evolve between distinguishing which surface, uh, rather which bulk structure was the proper one, because the uh, uh, the difference between HCP, BCC, and FCC are really very small energy differences, and so you need techniques where you have some uh, uh, confidence in the significance. And uh, just to show uh, that situation, uh, so just to state it, uh, what you say for the cohesive energy, you're looking at the difference in energy for, between the ion and the solid and the ion at infinity. And so look at a surface uh, situation, these are some First principles calculations that John Smith and I did a long time ago. Uh, if you thought of these sur these surfaces ex as extend rather the bulk is extending in both directions, the step is the positive charge density. What you do is take the atoms, smear them out into a uniform charge. This is something called the gelling model. The wiggly line is the electron density, and uh, you have to subtract actually the energy of this whole system integrated over both pieces and <coughs> actually the only difference in energy is a very tiny contribution from this region. So uh, what I'm going to talk about now is to try to go through the different, uh, give you a feeling for the different calculational schemes that are involved in doing these sorts of things. And the first one I'm going to call, the uh, first one is generally referred to as first principles in a sense, this is the, the best because the fewest input, uh, the least input goes into it, basically the atomic number and some physical constants. Uh, for the reasons that I showed you in that complicated picture, these are difficult to deal with. And so what people have tried in the past, for want of anything better, was pair, pair potentials, two body interactions like uh, Morris or Leonard Jones <coughs> potential. Those don't really take many body effects into account. So what's done is you try to doctor this pair potential to add maybe terms that do take those into account. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, semi-empirical potentials, which uh, have some basis, presumably, in, uh, in uh, first principles calculations and maybe do some of the many body parts correctly. Uh, schematically, what happens is that uh, uh, if you're just doing a fixed calculation where you have a fixed geometry and you just want a configurational energy, uh, you actually can just specify the geometry without knowing the physical description. But generally what happens if you want to do dynamics, uh, the evolution of that system goes into this geometry problem and then finally you come out with some sort of configurational uh, dynamics uh, 
uh, configurational energies or dynamical systems. <coughs> so let's first consider now the uh, first principles uh, calculations and uh, discuss how they, how they go, uh, how you would go about getting a solution in these cases. And what you do in these situations is to use something called the Cohn-Sham equations. And uh, what they are is a set of one electron equations uh, uh, where, you, where you solve the problem as though any given electron is in a mean field of all the other particles uh, around it. So the first step is that you write the Cohn-Sham equations, which are essentially the Schrodinger equation. You have some potential that has an electrostatic part and an exchange and correlation part. What I just talked about previously is called the mean field. You have some way of evaluating the uh, electrostatic potential. This exchange and correlation uh, energy is something that, uh, that's density de uh, de electron density dependent. And, uh, and then you use various approximations. One is the local density approximation that says that the potential or the energy just depend on the value of the electron density at a specific point in the solid. So there are, there are a number of uh, calculations. Uh, there, are, there are a number of approximations, even though it is a first principles calculation. And once you've solved the system, you get an electron density by uh, integrating over the wave functions, over, uh, integrating over the occupied states of the wave functions. Once you know this electron density, you uh, can then evaluate the total energy to some approximation. Uh, based on some expressions that are in terms of the electron density. <coughs> now, recently, uh, recently there have been some uh, approaches to actually deal with the uh, lack of periodicity problem in uh, first principles calculations. And uh, these things are called supercells. And if you had some sort of boundary uh, with a complicated structure, what you would try to do is build a bigger structure that would somehow represent the energies that you're interested in, and then you'd have a periodicity to take advantage of. But you can see this is a fairly complicated problem, uh, even so with uh, uh, using, the, uh, using first principles calculations. I should say that now, uh, in the first principles calculations, there are ways to do, these, uh, to do dynamics and energy uh, searches and these uh, the uh, people who develop these techniques are, their names are Car and Paranello. I'll have some references to it in the written version of the paper. So let's go backwards now. We're dealing with a very complicated situation in doing the first principles calculations for the reasons given. And so uh, let's now go through sort of the hierarchy I mentioned before. <coughs> and if we had a system of n atoms. Uh, and we could represent the cohesive energy as a, uh, this binding energy as a function of uh, position or configuration of the atoms in, in an expansion. And first term of the expansion would be the uh, two body forces, as I said, it would be like Lennart Jones or, uh, or I should say Van der Waals interactions. And then you might have other terms that represent high, uh, the many body uh, interactions. What's compelling about these? However, as you notice that without having to solve this system of differential equations and, and complicated techniques for treating the problem, if you could define a pair potential and meant something, all you'd have to do is specify the geometry and, uh, and it would involve just a simple sum over all these configurations. Not to say that that's easy because the geometry is going to be quite complicated as I showed. Uh, the problems with this are uh, the pair potentials aren't, uh, aren't correct for metals, as Professor Landman indicated, that the, uh, the energy for the metals depends on the electron density. Uh, they, don't give the shear, they don't give the correct relationship for the shear constants, and in addition, the vacancy formation energies uh, come out to be equal to the cohesive energy, whereas the vacancy formation energy in the metal is actually of the order of a third of the cohesive energy. Just to show you further uh, problem, this is a calculation John Smith and I did about six years ago for a grain boundary where we treated 
the bottom green, the Jellium model, by just having a step in the electron density at the interface. So again, this is the Jellium density. And you can see that you have a very complicated distribution of the uh, electron density at that interface. It depends on this depth of the step, and there's no way a pair potential can treat that kind of situation. Uh, for what's been done by, uh, to treat covalently bonded solids uh, by uh, Stillinger, Weber, and Tursoff, and a number of people, is to try to include a, uh, you would expect in something like silicon that there, since there's strong covalent binding, that there would be angle-dependent terms. And so what's done is to postulate some sort of angle-dependent forces, uh, have an expression for it, and then do the same kinds of sums, in, including the situation with pair potentials and with the, uh, with the angle-dependent uh, forces. And a number of constants appear in these things, and what you do is use some physical properties to try to fix these constants. For example, Stillinger and Weber uh, wanted to have the right structure for silicon and have right correct melting temperatures. Uh, this other class of uh, methods, the semi-empirical methods, I'm, I just want to mention quickly Finnis and St. Clair. I'm not going to deal with their method, but it's something that's based on tight binding theory. And it, it looks a lot like uh, it looks a lot like the embedded atom method, and it has two pieces to it, a, uh, uh, a, an embedding energy and a pair of repulsion, I'm sorry, an energy that depends on the electron density and a pair of repulsion term. And they get their electron density from overlap of atomic wave functions. Uh, to discuss now the uh, EAM and uh, the Sekul and Crystal method, I want to mention something uh, that John Smith, Jim Rose, and I discovered a number of years ago. And that's that the shape of the binding energy curves in many cases is the same. Uh, whether you're dealing with a molecule, whether you're dealing with an interfacial forces, chemisorption, or, or the bulk. And these are all uh, first principles calculations that have been rescaled to show that, in fact, they fall on one binding energy curve. And just to put it, a little more specifically. What we're saying is that the energy in any of these situations can be uh, represented by some well depth times some universal function that describes the shape of the curve. The scaling is given by uh, the distance minus the equilibrium distance, the value of, uh, uh, the, where the minimum occurs, divided by some scaling length. If the shape is truly the same, it doesn't matter what scaling length you use, so we chose one based on the second derivative because it's, it has some, uh, you, can, you can determine the second derivative uh, experimentally in many, uh, in many situations of the bonding. And finally, we found that the Rydberg function was an extremely good approximation to, these, uh, to the shape of that particular curve. And that's just the simple expression, one, minus the, uh, one plus the scale of length, e to the minus. Uh, scale length. Uh, since we're dealing with mainly uh, <coughs> comparing theoretical methods, we wanted to see what tests we could do in exper an experiment to see whether these ideas were correct, and we did a lot of them. Uh, and I'm going to select one that's based on the equation of state. The reason why I'm emphasizing that one is listening this, this particular week, week now, I can see that the pressure dependence uh, is something that uh, with volume is something that would be of interest. We have a number of others. <coughs> Previous to the atomic force microscope, this was the only one uh, where you had some information about some property versus distance, and so it was a particularly nice one. And so all you have to do basically is take the expression with our particular constants with it to get the pressure. Uh, when you, uh, this gives you an express, a simple expression like this. Sorry. For the pressure, where x is just the reduced volume. If you look at this expression, you can see that you can renormalize it. Well, maybe that's a bad term. You can regroup. Uh, you can regroup the variables uh, in terms of some quantity we're going to call log h. Ignore the lines in between. And if you take the log of this quantity h, then you get that 
you should have a straight line in replotting this equation of state data. And uh, the intercept of that straight line should be related to the bulk modulus of the solid and the, uh, and the slope related to the pressure derivative of the bulk modulus by these relationships. So let's see how well we do with that. Uh, I want to just concentrate on the metals. It turns out that when you replot the experimental data in this way, uh, that you get straight lines to correlation coefficients of 3 ninths and 4 ninths. And in fact, this has been applied in many different situations. Uh, for example, uh, it's worked in uh, compression of lubricants and some work that Binet, and in, in, in addition, phase transitions, and some work that Binet and Jakobsen have done. Uh, we've, we've been able to get the pressure dependence of the uh, shear stre uh, stress for polyethylene. Uh, uh, and uh, we can also predict the thermal de dependence of the bulk modulus and its pressure derivative uh, from this model. It turns out, I'm showing these other things, this result was much more general than, than we thought it was initially. And in fact, it applies to more than just metals. You can see we have ionic solids, ceramics, <coughs> Uh, rare gas solids and, uh, and hydrogen. Unfortunately, Pascal Binet, after doing this work as his dissertation, uh, became a businessman, and so uh, he didn't pursue these activities. Uh, but I think just the, the simple relationship might be of interest in, uh, in applying pressure to uh, how solids would deform uh, when you're applying pressure. Okay, let's move on now to the embedded atom method. And the way the embedded atom method works now, and it's based on something called effective medium theory or quasi-atom approach, is you treat the energy as a density-dependent term plus a pair repulsion term. Excuse the handwriting getting bad. I think I wrote this slide and several of the others after playing tennis the other day. Uh, uh, the embedding energy is the part that's the function of the electron density. This pair repulsion uh, just keeps the two pieces, uh, the two particles apart when you try to push them together. And the way they construct the electron density is from simple overlap of atomic orbitals. So in fact, you, there, uh, there are analytic expressions you can use to, to construct the electron density. So this step isn't anything particularly difficult. Uh, I'm not going to go into how, the, uh, how you break down between S and D states, I think. Uh, that doesn't matter as far as this discussion goes. You represent the pair interaction uh, by an expression like this and sort of an effective charge with something that decays rapidly so that it doesn't have a very long range. So the problem then boils down to how do you determine this embedding energy? And uh, most recently, what uh, uh, Foyles, Don, Besk uh, have done is to use our universal energy relationship uh, and the pair interaction uh, fitting to various physical parameters uh, such as the elastic constants, vacancy formation energies, uh, and so forth to determine the constants that appear in this equation. And then they can just generate a, t a table of this, uh, of this embedding energy. This is the, the sort of the, uh, the energy for holding the solid together, the glue in the solid. Uh, and once that's done, say, for example, for a nickel, uh, you don't have to do it again. And you just take that nickel embedding function, you look at a particular situation, and you say, uh, OK, I'm going to overlap the electron densities, calculate this embedding energy. I know the parameters and the pair potential. And so all I have to do then is evaluate this expression for a particular atom, uh, for a particular atom at some site in the solid. <coughs> In an older version, they treated uh, alloys by saying that, uh, that the pair potential, uh, uh, pair repulsion was just an average, and you use the embedding energy for, uh, for, each, uh, for each alloy atom that appears in the solid. So if it's a nickel atom, it feels a nickel embedding energy. If it's a copper atom, it feels a copper embedding energy. OK. I'd like to go on to something called uh, equivalent crystal theory that was really first developed by Smith and Banerjee, and then uh, a number of us have made some con contributions to its 
subsequently, and this is a little bit more abstruse to understand. And what it does is take advantage of the idea that, uh, that there is this universal binding energy curve. And so uh, if you have some sort of defect like a surface, the idea is that if you could write the, uh, the energy of this defect as the energy of this perfect crystal uh, that's either expanded or contracted from its equilibrium state plus a perturbation series, <coughs> Uh, then if there's a way to uh, uh, find, a, find what the equivalent, the equivalent lattice parameter would be for this uh, uh, perturbation, uh, for, the, uh, for this ideal crystal, uh, by having the uh, perturbation series sum to zero, we have a simple expression for calculating what the energy of the site uh, in the solid is. I know this is a bit abstruse, but I think I'll show, I'll show you how to apply it in a moment. <clears throat> and I think that'll be a little bit more straightforward. So what I was saying is that once, if there's some way you can sum this term to zero, then in fact you're just left with this simple uh, expression in terms of that Rydberg function to calculate what the, what the energy of the solid is. And uh, the way the interactions are represented in this uh, perturbation series uh, have to do with the uh, highest occupied orbitals and the assumption is that it has some sort of shape like uh, it has some sort of mathematical dependence like this and this quantity alpha is picked by fitting to vacancy formation energies. All the other parameters are essentially put into the uh, cohesive energy L, uh, or rather the scaling length and the equilibrium radius appear, express, uh, uh, appear explicitly in the expressions. So for next nearest neighbor interactions, it turns out you have to screen them. So an additional term is added to sort of de-emphasize the effects of next nearest uh, neighbor interactions. So what this amounts to is compared to the embedded atom method. And I'm going to give a specific example of this. This, this would be a term that would be the, uh, for the perfect equivalent crystal. This would somehow represent the defect. The unknowns are these uh, R1 and R2. However, since we're dealing with a perfect crystal, the next nearest neighbor distances are simply uh, constant times the nearest neighbor distances. And you have a transcendental equation to solve simply to get the energy. Just to represent more schematically what that is, is uh, when you go through this process, the defect, uh, the atom in the defect, feels a uh, different electron density. And it no longer thinks it's at the minimum in this binding energy curve, but it displaced uh, at some distance up the curve along it. And consequently, that contribution to the energy, the new, uh, the new density it feels, is, uh, is what the energy that, that that particular atom would have in the defect. Uh, subsequent to this, I, I showed a surface energy calculation, and I'm going to go through that, so let's just ignore this particular term. Subsequent to this, we've uh, to deal with some other problems, namely uh, covalently bonded solids like silicon, uh, and uh, to get the elastic constants right in this particular formulation, the elastic constants ended up being about 60% of what they should have been. We've gone into a procedure that's uh, more detailed to take these various terms into account, but in fact, uh, uh, calculating any one of these pieces is, is no more difficult than what I'm going to show you. Uh, I was preoccupied with alloys, but I should mention I'm not going to go into detail, but I've spent the past year, Guillermo uh, Bozzolo and I have spent the past year trying to extend these ideas to alloys, and we've been fairly successful. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, okay, and something's out of order. Okay, so let's go through an example uh, example of surface energy calculations uh, with embedded atom method and equivalent crystal. And let's look at this figure again. And let's assume this is a top plane of a 1, 0, 0 surface. And as you see, actually, you only have to consider one atom in the top plane, one atom in the second plane, and so forth, because all of these sites in this perfect 
surface are, are equivalent to each other. So in fact, with either method, it ends up being a relatively trivial calculation because there's no need to do, a, do the calculation for any more than a single atom, and that's representative of the uh, change in energy in any plane. So what you would do with the uh, embedded uh, atom method is you look at an atom in the surface plane, uh, you overlap the electron densities of the, the atoms that remain in the surface. Uh, once, you have, uh, once you've done that uh, overlapping of the electron densities, you look in your table for this embedding energy that uh, uh, Daw, Foils, and Basque have given you, and that gives you what the binding contribution to the energy is. You simply invite, uh, then you simply calculate the pair potential uh, part, which is uh, which is a simple analytic expression, and you have the energy for uh, that atom in the top plane of the surface, and you do the same for each subsequent plane. So you can see it's really, it's really essentially just once you've overlapped the densities, it's simply a matter of evaluating some very simple things, and then if you want the surface energy, you just add up these total energies, <laughs> the difference in energies between. Uh, those near the surface and the bulk divide by the cross-sectional area of the primitive cell. Now, uh, equivalent crystal theory uh, proceeds, the working equations are uh, essentially as simple. You look at this top atom, the, the equivalent crystal is perfect. I'm only going to discuss the next nearest neighbors. Uh, so it has all of its nearest neighbors and all of its next nearest neighbors are 12 and 6 in FCC. Uh, if you have the surface plane, uh, now an atom in the surface has lost four of its nearest neighbors, so you simply have to multiply this term by eight. It's lost one of its next nearest neighbors. Uh, you multiply it by uh, five. All of these quantities on this side of the equation are known. <coughs> if you're in the second plane down, uh, again, the equivalent crystal always has the same structure, it's perfect. In the second plane down, you've only lost one, uh, one next nearest neighbor. And so the procedure then is to solve this the first equation for R1, the second one for R2, and so forth, that you go uh, down each plane. Once you have that, uh, once you have R1, you can define this A star I'm talking about. <coughs> And uh, again, you do this, uh, uh, again, the, uh, calculating the energy yeah, simply involves evaluating an extremely simple expression uh, in terms of this Rydberg function. And so you just go down plane by, just go down plane, by plane and calculate the simple expression. Uh, the CPU time consuming uh, step in the AM comes from overlapping the atomic densities. And in equivalent crystal theory, it comes from solving the transcendental equation. In fact, the equivalent crystal theory uh, for a surface energy can be done in principle on a hand calculator if you had a programmable one. And it's easily done on a PC if you don't include any complications involved. Uh, now, unfortunately, I am. Uh, what I wanted to show you uh, next was the uh, uh, was what the contribution from each plane would be in this particular in these particular cases. And let me just state what it is because I can't uh, I can't seem to find that transparency. Maybe I'll run across it as I go through. Uh, the uh, it turns out that actually the top plane. And the second plane down for something like a 100 surface uh, in either EAM or uh, ECT uh, are sufficient to uh, uh, to get a cal to get a value for the surface energy. So you can see it's extremely trivial to get a value for the surface energy of the metals. And uh, uh, here it is. And uh, so, for example, the first plane contributes. 0.290 EV per atom in EAM and 0.0182 for the second plane. The next one is essentially negative. There's, di there's a disagreement in the surface energy, which I'll get to. For the 100 plane in ECT, you can see that the process converges very rapidly. 
If we do a 2, 1, 0 plane, say for aluminum, this was for nickel, since the lower lying planes have more nearest neighbors near the surface, you have to do a few more planes, which you can see. In this case, by the fourth plane down, you can do the surface energy of that surface. So either case, they're extremely trivial calculations. Uh, let's compare now how well you do with these. And I just want to focus <coughs> on two boxes because there's a lot of information here. Uh, let's look at uh, nickel for one case, which is an FCC metal. And uh, uh, here is the uh, ECT value, the embedded atom value. The embedded atom method tends to underestimate by about 40 to 50 percent the surface energy. Uh, here's, here it is for the 100 plane where there's a first principles calculation. Again, embedded atom method, and this is an experimental value for the surface energy. Uh, let's look now at the BCC system. Now there's some question as to whether uh, uh, embedded atom uh, method can treat BCC. I'm not going to go into it, but maybe somebody will have a question on that later. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we can do the uh, energy on a BCC system, and you can see that we again agree fairly well with, uh, I don't know where the ZAM value came from, I guess somebody tried to do it. Uh, uh, again, we agree uh, quite well with the uh, with first principles calculation, and if you consider the uh, experimental value to uh, involve a number of grains and figure you had to average these values in some way, uh, we get a, if you average them, you see that we get a value that's fairly close to the uh, to the experimental value in both cases. Uh, another issue here is the surface relaxation because you know a free surface. Uh, doesn't, uh, uh, by this, now I mean the interplanar relaxation. We're not going to allow any change in reconstruction, but just see what happens uh, when, uh, when we look at relaxation uh, between planes. And if, uh, if you look at what ECT does, apparently I don't have any embedded atom results on this slide. Uh, well, I'll show this separately. Uh, what, what we would predict is, oh, I do have them, can't see uh, What we would predict is that the top plane would contract by 7.6%, and the, uh, the top two planes, the next two planes, would expand by 3.4%. And this is in reasonable agreement with experiment. Uh, EAM doesn't do quite as well, again, in these situations. In either case, these are. Uh, with either method, you're dealing with uh, very tiny energy changes, and so it's remarkable that you can get anything close to the truth. If you examine some of the other ones that I have here, uh, you'll see that, in fact, uh, we do almost as well in most cases. Uh, the, uh, uh, oh, I have another thing I want to show. Uh, in, in applying it to uh, in applying it to uh, silicon, uh, we again get very good agreement with uh, first principles methods. This is the embedded atom. Uh, the rigid means that you just create the surface and don't allow any reconstruction. Uh, the one by one is allowing for this planar relaxation. We do okay on the top plane, not so well on the second plane compared to first principles calculations. And uh, as you can see, again, uh, ECT <coughs> seems to give a much better agreement for the reconstruction of silicon and the, uh, uh, the surface energies in those cases with first principles uh, than the EAM. <coughs> the EAM work was done later, and actually I'm not really conversant in how they modified the method to treat these situations. <coughs> His mitigating comment on the EAM. This, the free surface is a very severe test because there, the potentials are deviating most strongly from bulk potentials. The perturbation is very big, so that overlap of atomic densities uh, uh, is maybe a severe, a severe limitation on that particular problem. Uh, and uh, however, for internal, there are reasons to. Uh, there are reasons to believe for internal interfaces that it wouldn't be uh, too bad. And if somebody wants to ask me about that later, I'll go through an argument about why uh, 
for an internal interface, you wouldn't expect the AM to be uh, very bad. Another, another critical issue, however, is do they get the trends right? And certainly AM has been tested in many situations where it predicts properties quite correctly. I guess I'm pushing our method because it's our method and it does give quantitatively uh, very good results. So let's look at adhesion a little bit again. And let me uh, just redefine that. The way I defined adhesion in the calculation of them, I hate to say almost 18 years ago now, uh, is to uh, look at two different metals in contact, pull them apart, and look at the binding energy as a function of separation. And these were all done in a gelium calculation. And uh, what, I, what I got in this case is this curves that look like that. Uh, I, uh, I showed you at the beginning, energy versus separation. In this case, for these different metal uh, interfaces, the, uh, uh, the well depth would essentially be the, uh, the uh, binding energy for putting two metals into uh, contact. The reason why I raised this whole work is that there are a lot of assumptions made about uh, compatibility of materials and other uh, other comments, you know, do you have to have solubility to get a strong binding force? And the reason why I did this calculation to begin with was to show that, uh, <coughs> I should say Jen Smith and I did the calculation to begin with, was to show that in fact, indeed, irregardless of any of these uh, uh, compatibility conditions, that simply by electron sharing across the interface, you could get very strong binding forces. Incidentally, the range of these forces is only about an interplanar spacing. <coughs> and uh, one other point uh, that's not apparent in these curves is that what we found was that the interface could be stronger than the weaker of the, uh, of the two materials. So uh, a number of uh, interesting effects came out of these metal-metal calculations. However, they're very, they're very limited in the sense that we used the gelium model and crystallinity was in introduced into them in an ad hoc fashion for the people who do these kinds of things. Basically what we did was a Lane cone calculation, putting the two pieces together. Would you repeat that statement? Did yes. you say you found the interface was weaker or no, stronger? No, stronger. Did I say weaker? No, I didn't hear it. I'm sorry, let me repeat it. What I said was that what we found was that the interfacial binding could be stronger than the weaker of the two metals. A simple rule, but for the case of the town and the case of the town? Uh, not that I could find. The, the number of situations we could do uh, in this particular formalism are, are limited. And uh, what I'm going to show you now, and what are uh, my main objective for developing these alloy potentials, was to be able to treat uh, this problem and maybe be able to do enough situations <coughs> simply so that we could maybe find some simple rules in it. John, how do you define A equals zero distance? Uh, that's the inner plane. Well, in this case, it's a little fussy. In the pure, me in the pure metal, pure metal interface, it's just the inner planar spacing. In this case, we basically average the inner planar spacings uh, to define it. That's a touch point. So what, why is the universe the some distance away from the part? Wouldn't the inner planar spacing be the place of the minimum? Well, it, it is, but I mean, just for computational uh, reasons, I had to do that. Okay. Uh, again, when we looked at all of these, they scaled. Okay, let me just show you now embedded atom calculation. Where that, that, those calculations involve several years of my life uh, to generate those binding energy curves. Uh, here are the same types of calculations I was able to do in a day uh, with a PC. It, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, not embedded atom, but equivalent crystal theory. You could do the same with embedded atom. The only difference now with surface, uh, from surface energy calculation is that you have the surfaces, you have the other surface there and they're just farther away and you just go through the same procedure in either case. But now you, you haven't lost the nearest neighbors, they're just farther away and next nearest neighbors. And uh, just to show you, from, uh, also these are the scale curves again. Uh, I don't want to comment on the solid line, but I might if it comes up during the discussion. 
right now. Again, they scale. We can do the same thing extremely easily with BCC interfaces, any interface we want to deal with. What is your vertical axis on that? Pardon? What is the vertical axis? Vertical, vertical axis is the scaled energy, binding energy in that scale form I showed you, and this is the scale distance on these. And I just want to show that iron and tungsten do have the same shape and map onto the same curve. Uh, you can easily do the forces between planes. It's just the derivative of these two. In fact, we can formulate it directly in this method. And again, it's an extremely trivial thing to do now. Surface energy for metal is, is a, I say, a, a day's work on PC if you don't want to include relaxations. And I want to talk about an effect Professor Tabor uh, raised the other day, uh, something called avalanche. Uh, this is sort of an extension of the adhesion idea because when we did the original calculation, we were extremely naive. And in fact, we couldn't do anything about it anyway because within the gelling calculation, there was really no structure. And what, this, uh, what we're doing now is bringing the two pieces of the solid together. And we're going to look at what happens when you do that. And this is a curve uh, for keeping uh, the bulk with with these computer techniques, you can play whatever games you want to play. Uh, and so what we do is just allow the first two planes to move and keep the rest of the solids rigid. And we see that for this first plane moving, if you're at a distance of 2.6 angstroms, there's a potential barrier to the first plane moving. However, when you get to 1.9 angstroms, uh, the potential barrier no longer occurs and the two planes want to snap together. If you carry the, if you now uh, allow more and more planes to participate in this relaxation process, uh, you can see that at a larger and larger separation that the uh, that you'll get a snapping together at this interface. For example, if we if we included a hundred planes, uh, then somewhere around five angstroms uh, you would get the snapping together of all those hundred planes into the inter intermediate region. This, the explanation for this, this was actually something that uh, we got the idea from a paper of Pethica and Sutton, and we were lucky enough to uh, have, uh, we were lucky enough to have been the ones who wrote uh, his wrote a letter on it, and they weren't lucky enough. So. Uh, and uh, however, they did it with a uh, with a Van der Waals interaction, and we're doing it with something that's more appropriate for metals. Uh, it turns out that you don't have to worry about the walls collapsing on you. I, we did this since our uh, since uh, it's simply a matter that the spring constant depends on the length of the solid uh, that you're allowing to relax. In our case, uh, that length uh, depends exponentially on uh, this uh, separation. This should have been piece of iron. Uh, and for uh, a separation of about 10 angstroms, I think for nickel you got about one centimeter. I should have brought this table, but I don't, I don't remember the numbers. And if you have a separation of 100 angstroms, uh, the length of the solid starts to be astronomical distances. Uh, of course, at this distance, our force law is no longer really applicable, and you're going to have something like the Van der Waals interaction taking over. Uh, John? What exactly is relax? What is jumping together in your computer model? And what's uh, holding it apart? Pardon? And what's holding well, it apart? Holding, we're everything? holding the walls rigid at the at the back place, and we're just keeping parts of the bulk rigid in, in some way. And we're only allowing <coughs> the you know, the, uh, the planes, certain numbers of planes, to relax. We have that kind of control on the system. If you look at the energy now for this hundred layers, you see that. You get a sudden, uh, this would be our old adhesion curve along here, and uh, so sort of the rigid adhesion case, and what happens is you have a catastrophic event, and uh, a couple of people at our lab, Benergy and Good, have done uh, the MD on this, and you do get waves propagating away from the surface as, you, uh, as the collapse occurs, and uh, also Dodson and Sandia is using the bedded atom method, and you get essentially the same kinds of predictions. What I'd like to go to now is something we call slip. And I hope I can get to uh, 
I hope I can get to uh, also John and Tomonic's work. Uh, I probably won't get, get to what we're trying to do with uh, ceramics. Uh, uh, okay, by slip, I mean, we're going to allow one half space to slide over another half space. This is an extremely ideal situation to allow no relaxation. Okay, so keep top, bottom rigid and translate in a whole bunch of directions. When we did this, we found that the energy, and we did it for one zero zero surface, and I know it's not this little plane. Uh, we found that the energy could be expressed in a very simple uh, Fourier series, where, where in fact we only had to go to one term beyond the uh, Frankel model to get a rather accurate representation of uh, that whole energy surface. And what we did was, uh, we were applying no load, but there's no reason why we couldn't apply a load and do something you might loosely call friction. We allowed it to breathe in the z direction. In other words, when it bumps into the barrier, it's going to have to move in the z direction. So, uh, and so the results of this are fairly interesting. Uh, First, just checking our checking our expression versus the uh, versus our ECT calculation. This is the uh, registry binding energy curve. I think this was separating things in the non-top site to see uh, to see how well our expression represented the numerical calculations. This might have been at a bridge site. Uh, so this is just pulling the two pieces apart and seeing how our expression does. The next uh, the next piece is uh, if, we, if we translate, uh, say, in a one zero zero direction, uh, we get a, a structure that looks like this. If we translate in, say, a three, four, five triangle direction, we get a result that looks like this. So our expression can represent either of these two cases. And the really interesting thing with this is note that, again, we found the scaling in this. The length scaling is no surprise. I mean, there's a natural periodicity on the surface. However, uh, this, this uh, magnitude scaling was a surprise. And what we found was that once we, uh, uh, we divided by the surface energy, divided our, that expansion by the surface energy, that again, essentially, to a high degree of accuracy, the uh, representation of those uh, uh, the slip energy curves uh, was the same in both cases. And uh, let me show you a prettier picture. Uh, just to show you the. Uh, effectiveness now is we could easily uh, map that looks okay. uh, we could easily map the forces for translating in any direction we wanted to and uh, and the colors and the sizes of the arrows just indicate the magnitudes of, of the forces and there's nothing surprising in there. The next step we want to do is introduce relaxation and dislocations and see what effects these have uh, on the whole process. And another reason why I'm interested in pursuing this is uh, Professor Margis, a number of years ago, did some very interesting friction experiments. Let me say there's no friction in this. We just pull it up to the top of the hill, and that, that's it. Uh, where uh, he found that when you loaded lightly and didn't, uh, didn't affect dislocations, he essentially got zero friction, and you didn't see friction until you essentially had some created or had some interaction with this dislocation. And now with this alloy theory, we can, uh, we can have a very hard indenter and a soft substrate and maybe investigate some of these ideas. Uh, five minutes? Oh, good. Okay. Another interesting thing that comes out of this is that uh, we could get a rule of thumb uh, from the scaling about the uh, energy barrier uh, for different materials. What we found was that the maximum energy barrier is about a third of the surface energy, and we could do the same thing for the uh, maximum, well, I use the word loosely, shear stress. And it's simply uh, a number of times the surface energy divided by the distance. If we check our calculation, somebody thought would challenge me on this, uh, versus whisker strengths. I'm in Germany, I wanted to say whisker strengths. Uh, uh, assuming that the whiskers actually fail in slip, 
I guess I've seen some pictures when you pull normally that with their slip bands on it. I, it's, uh, whiskers have few dislocations, so they have to be a lot stronger uh, than uh, bulk solids would be. And we got reasonable numbers. But again, this, this is an ideal result. And I reiterate, there's no friction. Uh, Jung and Tamanic have done uh, similar first principles calculation, which they want to do uh, relate to AFM. And they had a layer of palladium on a graphite substrate. And so they did something similar and translated this palladium layer. Uh, they get similar potential barriers depending on what direction you slide in. And uh, they define a friction coefficient as an average over sliding over a certain distance. And they, they use the maximum barrier height uh, uh, to represent the energy loss. And then they are applying a load in their particular case. And from that, they can estimate a, a friction coefficient. They get a rather strange behavior down here because there's a reconstruction, uh, apparently, as you load the two surfaces. And then as you continue uh, to load, uh, you, uh, you get a change in what they call a friction force. However, I don't, uh, I don't feel there's any friction in this model, actually. Uh, they're just saying, OK, you pull it up to the top of the hill, and the energy goes away somehow. Uh, so it's not like people like Uzi, uh, uh, you know, who really, uh, and other MD people who really try to think about how you would put a friction force. And I, I could have called my, my calculation a friction force also, however, it's clearly not. Do I have a couple more things? Okay, good. I just wanted to show a couple of things. These, to show that uh, first principles calculations have much more versatility. This is some work by Lambert and Sidney Siegel uh, trying to, uh, in, in materials. The other, the other potentials are really limited as far as what kind of materials they're, they're applied to. For another advantage in first principles is they'll apply to anything. And so they were trying to do ceramic interfaces. And they tried a number of different super lattices and could estimate uh, essentially the uh, interfacial energies depending on which structure that, that they used. What we're doing now is trying to, say, push a simple idea as far as you can. What most people do, say, with ionic solids is to use something called the Born-Meyer potential, which has an exponential repulsive core and a, uh, an ionic uh, Coulombic attraction. And so when you add these two pieces together, you get some sort of binding energy curve that looks like that. What we're arguing is that actually an expression like this is a much more reasonable term because this allows for the possibility of some covalent bonding. And uh, consequently, uh, uh, you might be able to treat a, more, uh, more, a, a broader class of, mater uh, of materials such as ceramics with an expression like this. Just two more slides. <laughs> Uh, to test it, we first tried it out on diatomics. Uh, the triangles are the Rydberg function. Um, I'm sorry, this, you can't see this. First one's aluminum chloride. This is aluminum chloride. And this is lithium chloride. These are all first principles calculations. Our expression, which is the, the solid line is our expression. The circles are, are the first principles calculations. And we could get a very good representation of the binding energy relation in these cases. If we thought about solids, we said, OK, let's take our expression and say we know the bulk modulus, we know the pressure over the bulk modulus and cohesive energy and equilibrium parameters. And let's see what it implies about the charge transfer and about the uh, well depth of that Rydberg part. And uh, in fact, when we do that, we get very reasonable numbers for the charge transfers. and that. The, the coefficient of the Rydberg part divided by the cohesive energy ends up being fairly small and, again, fairly reasonable numbers. So we don't have a method yet from that, but uh, I'm hoping that somehow, on some variation of what we've done with alloys, which I haven't showed you, uh, we can maybe come up with a method to deal with, uh, deal with the situation where you have charge transfers and maybe uh, do some similar calculations with ceramics. And one, one final comment is 
I think at this stage of things, the relationship between the semi-empirical to the um, uh, first principles is that the semi-empirical, the first principles are basically the laboratory for the semi-empirical. In other words, we come up with a method like this, and the test is you have to take some known geometry, do a first principles calculation, and see if we get a, get a good number out of that. So there has to be a, uh, a marriage of the two to uh, maybe treat these very complicated situations you're going to see later this morning. Thank you. Uh, one on, on the, I believe, definition of adhesion energy. Actually, John, there's another clarification which I wouldn't mind if you made once if you had it. And that, could you clarify whether by avalanche effect you mean two surfaces that spontaneously uh, jump into contact, or what I gathered you were saying, something more deep than that, is that only one molecular layer was detaching from the surfaces and Okay, please. Uh, uh, first, before clarifying, I think uh, one remark I should make is to uh, acknowledge Don Buckley, whose group I was in for many years and sort of pioneered uh, the idea that uh, people should look at atomistic effects and sort of was an inspiration for a lot of my work and other people's work. Uh, okay, I, I tried at the beginning to deal with. Uh, some terminology difficulties, and I understand that people use words in different ways. So, uh, uh, sometimes when people are talking about the, uh, uh, what I call adhesion, uh, they use the word uh, cohesion for that. And I think uh, by cohesion, they mean two similar materials in contact. I'm making the distinction that I'm calling every, uh, not similar, but the same material, say nickel and nickel. Uh, I am calling any processes that separate at the plane, no matter what's in contact, adhesion. If they were the same, uh, well, and cohesion is this process of completely blowing apart uh, the whole solid. So, okay, it's just expanding it or contracting the whole thing uniformly. So, uh, when this is, the, this is sort of uh, the cohesive energy that I'm talking about, is the bulk energy to, to, do, to do this particular process. Uh, some people might say that, it, uh, that this is cohesion and you get twice the surface energy, and that's, you know, uh, I would have the same definition of just using a different word for the same thing. Uh, and let's just go over these binding energy curves one more time. Uh, uh, depending on the process, you get some uh, curve like this. If you were if you were going to uh, pull, say, two pieces of the solid apart now in what I call adhesion, your the inflection point is where the maximum stress occurs. Uh, and uh, so, when you pull the two pieces apart beyond that point, uh, then uh, then there isn't say a, a uh, the restoring force is such that. Uh, uh, you're overcoming it. If you would apply this much force, then the two pieces can continue to move together. The, the applied force is greater than the restoring force. Uh, same thing applies if you're sliding one half space over another one. You're going to have some potential barrier like this. And uh, until you get to this force again at the inflection point, the restoring force is going to be such that you don't get any catastrophic movement of the two surfaces. That is, Essentially, you have sort of a static situation. Now, to answer Jacob's uh, question, uh, I wasn't uh, <coughs> I wasn't trying to say that for uh, the uh, uh, all, all I was doing was essentially uh, an experiment uh, that that you can do with these kinds of calculations and just say, okay, suppose I just let one plane move. Uh, what happens, and uh, suppose then I just let two planes move, but the real effect is that you have a solid of a certain length in the whole thing. If you fix, if you fix the endpoint rigidly, the whole thing is going to contract and come together. Okay, thank you. Well, we can start with the discussions. I mean, questions. Can we start? Gilbert Pollock. <coughs> 
my question is about avalanching. It seems to me that this phenomenon could be very important as regards uh, friction because it has such a drastic effect on the contact area. There's plenty of evidence for the sudden instantaneous jumping together of two surfaces. There's ev evidence from the kind of uh, micro-contact experiments that, uh, that were done at Lancaster, which I talked about last week. There's evidence from STM work. People have reported a sudden transition from tunneling to uh, atomic contact. There's, there's evidence from AFM work and, of course, from molecular dynamics simulations. What's difficult, it seems to me, is to separate out various possible contributions. There's the calculations you've just described um, for perfectly flat surfaces. There's the, there's the work of uh, Pethica and Sutton for, um, for tips contacting flat surfaces. If I remember right, that was their analysis. There's the simple JKRS type analysis where uh, you take a sphere and a flat, say, and, and you, you bring them slowly to contact and you look at, at what happens when the surface energy is, is released. And that must also produce uh, a sudden instantaneous increase in the contact area. And then there's uh, a more drastic version of that involving plastic deformation. And I just wonder if you have any comments as to whether some of these various effects, in fact, we might be talking about the same thing. For instance, what's the relation between what you've described and the simple JKRS analysis of what happens to the adhesion energy when, when you bring them together. I, I guess I would feel that they, uh, that they are, you know, they are the same effect. Uh, we've done similarly following up on uh, Professor Petrica's work and looked at looked at a tip and there's an instability, you know, in, in those situations uh, too, which you get to a certain certain distance, and I think. Uh, they're fundamentally the same uh, process. I, I can't really think very well in continuum mechanics. The atomistic <coughs> models are much clearer to me, but it seems to me it has to be the same, essentially the same type of situation going on in all of those cases. Professor Table. David Table. Um, this is the third lecture I've heard which uh, shows that separating surfaces to create free, free surface is not a reversible process. And I, I now feel, I now recognize that my introductory model, which suggested it was reversible, is wrong. And I stand corrected. And I'm glad to have learned from this from the lecturers who have exposed it. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. One is that uh, when you were talking about the way in which you could calculate the um, energy change when you had a defect in the system. It wasn't clear to me whether you were concerned with energy calculations alone or whether you take into account the entropy effects which must be involved if you put defects in and whether this applies in general to the form of calculation you've been doing as to whether the entropy factor whether it emerges just from the calculation or whether it's something that's not taken into account. Uh, these are essentially all zero temperature calculations, and so I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, so we, I guess uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who's the one? Thank you. Uh, let me make a comment about the questions that was asked before about the distinction between tips and. Uh, uh, two semi-infinite surfaces. Of course, in the case of that you bring two semi-infinite uh, uh, surfaces uh, together, two semi-infinite solids, there's nothing to break the symmetry of the situation. So it's very different than bringing a finite piece of material against uh, a surface of uh, a semi-infinite solid. Uh, so you expect, um, in the case of uh, 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 two uh, semi-infinite solids coming together, uh, an effect that, um, uh, such as uh, Pathica described first, uh, John and ourself and probably others have seen in the literature, uh, of uh, the whole uh, two semi-infinite surfaces coming together and then this propagates uh, into the bulk. While when you have a finite, finite thing, uh, 
then you have uh, at the edges and the ability also of the great uh, connective necks and the like. So there's a question of symmetry breaking that does not apply when you have two translationally invariant things in the x-y direction. Let me say something about the uh, questions of uh, the extent of the uh, relaxation of lattice planes. This is, uh, of course, not, uh, not uh, unique to the case of uh, bringing two surfaces together. Um, it has been uh, the idea back in 76 of Finnis and Heine to explain metal surface relaxation, a known phenomena that uh, when you have uh, a metal surface, uh, particularly the open surfaces of the FCC solids, like the 110 surface, is that the distance between the first to the second uh, metal plane contracts, the second to the third expands, and so on. As a matter of fact, they have done it only to the first to the second contraction, which is a purely electro gas effect. And uh, back in 79 and 1980, uh, people in my group and myself, we have extended it to oscillatory relaxation that decays exponentially towards the bulk ladder spacing. So these phenomena of exposing one part to the other, namely breaking the symmetry of the solid, at least in one direction, in the z direction, or in the case of tip, are the driving forces for all these phenomena. So one has to make a clear distinction between the a case of two semi-infinite surfaces coming together to one finite against uh, against uh, another extended so yeah, I, I have nothing to say, but I agree with all those comments. You know, we're we're not at the level of sophistication that you are in treating you know those other geometries at this point. Could I just uh, ask Uzi or, or John on, on this particular issue? Is the, would one be in general expect that the surface density would always be higher or lower? Or does it depend specifically on the material and the interactions? For a solid? Yes. Surface density for a solid? Yeah, would it expand uh, or would it, would it contract always for all materials? I mean, is, is there something basic about the, the first layer being Contract. Interesting point. If you take Leonard Jones potentials, uh, such as, for example, describing rare gases, see, uh, always it's just in the Leonard Jones potential, this can show, be shown analytically, it doesn't take the calculation, that it always shows an expansion outwards. Namely, the first layer of the solid always goes outwards because it's a counting lack of neighbors. So you don't have as many neighbors, it's a different coordination. Metals both theoretically, in good theories, and experimentally show that the open faces, namely the 1-0 one, one phase compared to the 1-1-1, one, 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 contract in this thing. So this is a big distinction. If you do Leonard Jones calculations, the first to the second layer expands out. Well, metals, both uh, low energy electro diffraction, helium scattering, and many other methods show that it's actually a contraction. And the idea is that the atom is trying to gain as much embedding in the electron gas, so he pulls himself inwards rather than putting himself out, outwards. So there's a, there's a so metals inwards, uh, covalent solids. This uh, more complicated silicon is a very complicated case. Um, uh, rare gas solids, molecular solids, um, uh, such as uh, solid argon. It's outwards. Yeah, the way I rationalize that particular point is the same way that Lucy explained it. If, uh, the real relationship is not this energy uh, distance, but energy electron density. And so when you remove the other half of the solid in the case of the metals, uh, it would like to be driven towards the point where we have the density of the bulk, which is its lowest energy uh, situation. And so the two surface, the top surfaces would want to uh, contract towards each other, and then the next surface, which the two three planes, uh, now because of that contraction, they have an increased density, electron density of the one that and so on. Uh, I'd just like to return back to the question of reversibility very quickly, and I think what you say is correct if you're bringing two surfaces together in a, in a uniform way. But if you have a peeling experiment, as you do in contact adhesion, or a, a fracture experiment, of course, you're, you're really, you have a spectrum of displacements. And under those conditions, I think that you can preserve reversibility quite well. But the, the question I wanted to ask you is, you mentioned these universal curves, the potential functions. And it seems to me that that's, in, in my na naive way of looking at it, that would be a very useful and something one could expect for a, a given class of materials such as metals. 
But if you were to go, say, from metals to, to say, ceramics, where there's ionic bonds and covalent bonds, how well can this, how universal is this, this, this notion of a universal potential function? I, yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, universal in most cases, except for the form. I think uh, I could explain why. Uh, I have some hand waving arguments why, in the equation of state, it seemed to uh, work fairly well for those other classes of solids in the compressive region. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, in fact, I know it doesn't work well in, uh, you know, in the expanded region. However, if you use that other expression I presented, uh, where you have those two pieces, we seem to be able to represent those cases uh, reasonably, uh, reasonably well. As far as the, the crack goes, uh, we've done some very preliminary stuff. Just the idea of what the implications of the avalanche would be in a case where you had a triangular, you know, some sort of wedge in the thing, but I just don't have anything uh, really to say about that at this point. They're just preliminary results. Mark Robbins. Hi, a uh, couple of questions. First of all, in your sliding of the, the sliding calculation, we calculate force versus displacement. You said you got scaling of those results. But given that the entire basis of the potentials you're using was the scaling form, is that really surprising? Uh, yeah, I think it is, because uh, that, that's a legitimate question you could ask either in the adhesion case or the, or the slip case. However, since we're dealing with the sum of, you know, over the planes of atoms that feel a different, essentially, density contribution, it's not obvious to me that when the sum <coughs> these individual terms that it's going to end up being that scale function again. Uh, it's not clear. The second is sort of related, and that, that's there's many different ways that you could break up the actual potential into the parapotential plus uh, the, the other term, which basically gives the universal form. And there's also many different forms of the atomic charge density that one could use. And I know sometimes people change the real atomic density, say, well, it's obviously different in, in the solid. And, and so the issue is, how unique are these potentials and these divisions? And should one think of them just as, as useful parameters? What parameterizations of the real physics, which you could split up in many different ways to get comparable results? Or if I were to shift things around a little bit, would I get very different behavior? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I guess I look at it just from a functional standpoint. You know, if we do well in predicting the first uh, principles uh, it results, then we charge ahead uh, whether we have a good reason to do so or not. <laughs> and uh, I, I haven't tried to look at Finnis and Claire EM and our methods and see you know, if there's some, some similarity or uniqueness in those forms. Um, Cliff Slaughterbeck, University of Washington. Uh, given that the, the, a couple of days ago uh, there was a discussion that you know there's a lot of oxide layers on top of the surface, and they, uh, the question is, are they glassy uh, or are they you know faceted type of materials? It seems to me that a question of interest is, has molecular dynamics, either you or anybody else here, been able to look at other statistical distributions of, of solids, or is that just too hard of a problem to deal with? I guess I haven't done anything with molecular dynamics, so I'm going to defer that to Lucy or, or Mark. I did not understand the question. Oh. I did not understand the question, at least maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> he wants well, to know what you know. Yes, yeah. It, 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 I mean, the difficulty is, is, as John described, is you know that in many of these oxide type surfaces, they're not periodic. And is that give too much of a problem? Uh, I guess we're, 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 still, we're still starting, I guess, on the simple periodic things. And I don't think any of us have got a clear enough understanding of those situations that we've moved on to the more, more complicated ones yet. It's just a matter of patience and computer time, I guess, eventually, to try to model them. Though obviously, oxide potentials I think are, are less well understood than some of these metallic potentials, and you're always only as good as the potential to feed into the simulation. Let me say a word to add to that, what I, that's really the state of things. The, uh, 
the, um, uh, we've done some calculations on defects in ionic solids, single defects. And so when we've seen that it has no effect on the shear strengths of that solid, well, we should have, been, we should have known better than spend our computer time than think about it before, or reading in the literature that indeed single defects do not affect really the strengths of solid vacancies and, uh, in this low concentration. It takes much more extended defects, like dislocations and other. So uh, some work has been done. The question of oxides is a very severe one, and it takes uh, time and resources to develop these oxide potentials and uh, this work uh, in this direction. Yeah, and then what I ended with was <coughs> essentially what we're trying to do along those lines right now with this extremely preliminary work uh, just trying to examine the situation. Uh, Frank Ogilfried from Berkeley. I had a couple of questions about the sliding calculation. First, just if I understood right, you were saying there was no relaxation in X and Y, but you did a lot of relaxations in Z. Um, I think the energy you got was something like a third of the, the um, adhesion energy. If you, is it possible to allow the relaxations in X and Y, or do the unit cells get too big? And would you have a guess as to how much that would, are you going to try to do that? No, we're going to try to do that. I think it probably, as I say, again, I don't really have the experience uh, in it, uh, but the, uh, it seems to me in, in this simple-minded uh, approach we're taking in that, that there are some symmetries that you can take advantage of in the situations that uh, would make it not too bad. And also in that, if you do that sliding calculation, if you go over the top, can you say anything about where the energy would go, or does that really take molecular no, dynamics? I, I think it really takes, you know, maybe what OZ does. We're just, this sort of setting an upper bound on things, essentially. Kevin Jones. Uh, in my simple-minded way of thinking, if, we, if I'm referring to the energy displacement curve that's on the screen and sliding, uh, in my simple way of thinking, I assume that that uh, barrier height energy was dissipated, and I think that's what was implied with uh, David Taper's uh, model with magnets. But you said something uh, en passant which suggested that might not be the case. Could you expand a little? I, I guess I, I don't follow exactly what you're saying. It's just that we didn't consider that. We're just looking at basically a static situation and the energy. <coughs> There's no dissipation in it whatsoever. I thought that uh, Professor Tabor's comment was extremely interesting, and I wanted to look to see if you could uh, maybe move one surface over another and look at elastic constants and look at the forces and see if there's some instability that occurs in those cases. Well, I think perhaps I didn't make my um, question clear enough. No, I accept uh, uh, restoring energy all the way up that uh, uh, rising curve, but it's what happens next when you uh, displace further? And, I mean, I assume that all that energy um, will be dissipated. Well, if that's not the case, uh, what's the reason why? Uh, uh, that, that was the assumption that uh, Joan and Timonic made. I, I just have no mechanism for energy dissipation, what I did. With, I'm sorry, are you trying to signal something to me? Oh, okay. I, I there's and uh, I'm just have no explanation. You know, in principle, we're doing a conservative calculation. If it fell back down the hill, presumably the energy would stay in it, which is obviously not the real situation. John, in your uh, table of the calculation of the surface energies with different methods and comparison to experiment, there seem to be factors of two or four difference in some of those numbers. Maybe factors of two. Uh, now the factor of two uh, the. The scale, I'm sorry, finish your question. Well, my question was this, if it's possible now with single crystals to measure the binding energy of an adsorbed atom using different thermal absorption methods with an accuracy of a few percent, I wonder if, if you had those data for, say, many metals on dissimilar metal single crystals, whether that information would be useful in refining the types of energies that, uh, that you're trying to calculate getting you know, an experimental yeah, checkpoint. Yeah, I definitely think Easy to transform from that measurement to, let's say, uh, separation energy of your facial separation. Yeah, we've done, we've done the, uh, now that we have a method to do two component systems, those would be very, and it would, that's a calculation we could do, mm -hmm. and it would be very interesting to compare to. Well, that would be trivial to do with methods that exist. Yes, yes, it would be trivial. 
at John Pethick at the University of Oxford. Um, I just wonder if I could uh, play devil's advocate um, to, as it were, cut off the theory and prevent it getting so far away from the real problems which we've been hearing. Um, you've mentioned uh, justifying the semi-empirical methods that you've got, and there's lots of them, by reference to ab initio techniques. Um, that may, may not be ab initio people here, but could I suggest that it's really not relevant? Um, <laughs> that uh, you don't need to justify your methods by ab initio techniques, you just look up the elastic constants in a book and if they work, that's fine. Uh, we don't need to go the whole hog and do all that stuff. Could I, could I suggest you provided the best stop point, um, you know, semi-empirical methods for theoretical work. And the real problem is applying to more complex geometries, not going back to justifying them in terms of some very remote... <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I guess the trouble with that is that we're building those into our calculation now the embedded out people and so do we. So uh, I don't know, you know what our prediction was. The, the initial form of this equivalent crystal theory, we got we got them wrong, so we changed it to get it right, basically. Um, I wanted to get back to the uh, question that, that that Professor Johnson uh, raised about your uh, curves of um, transverse force versus um, position and understanding you know, if you cal calculate the maximum transverse force, uh, how much that energy is in fact um, released in uh, dissipation. And uh, you can actually make a general argument which is uh, based, in fact I think first uh, goes back to Tomlinson uh, in 1928 I believe, that what actually counts is the, is the ratio of the essentially interfacial uh, potential strength and is measured by the um, second derivative of the interfacial potential, to, um, the ratio of that two to the effective um, force constant holding the solid together. And uh, in fact, if the force constant is relatively stiff, um, if, if the solid force constant is relatively stiff, um, one finds that the sliding occurs with no dissipation. This plucking only occurs when the, uh, the interfacial uh, force is relatively strong uh, compared to the, to the force holding the solids together. So, I'll, I'll actually amplify that to come to our talk tomorrow. Uh, my answer to that question is 0.27. I've been waiting a week to use that. <laughs> so, uh, I think you're going to go in. You're going to go into those uh, the time lumps and mile in your your talk. So. Steve Gleric. It seems one of the most important issues that we've been discussing in these uh, over the last ten days is whether deformation is necessarily uh, reversible or irreversible. And clearly, in, in a model such as yours, it is necessarily uh, reversible because there's no way to uh, dissipate energy. In the model, in the video of Professor Tabor, it was necessarily irreversible because he provided a way to dissipate energy in every instance. And so we have an argument, however, about whether one can generalize and whether the real world is necessarily either one or the other. It would seem that, and so this brings me to my question, which is to ask you to speculate and climb out on a limb. Is this an answer that can be calculated? Could one? Uh, in principle, know, let's say, the, the phonon spectrum of the solid in question and decide on that basis whether there is a way for this solid to dissipate this particular bundle of energy or not. And you can imagine that depending on the solid and the frequency of the energy, there would or there would not. I, I guess uh, I imagine that, in fact, it is, it is something that's possible you know, to, uh, to approach it. In a sense, maybe the molecular dynamics uh, methods have have built into them a way to dissipate the energy. Uh, another aspect is sort of uh, plastic deformation. You know that you uh, in some of these MD calculations you can see uh, dislocations forming and things running along slope planes. You know, and uh, when when you apply forces, so in fact, I think there are ways to uh, treat the dissipation problem. Well, thank you very much for that presentation, John.